the age of chivalry chapter seventeen from bullfinch the age of chivalry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the age of chivalry by thomas bullfinch chapter seventeen sir tristram on arriving in brittany tristram found king hoyle engaged in a war with a rebellious vassal and hard pressed by his enemy his best knights had fallen in a late battle and he knew not where to turn for assistance tristram volunteered his aid it was accepted and the army of hoyle led by tristram and inspired by his example gained a complete victory the king penetrated by the most lively sentiments of gratitude and having informed himself of tristram's birth offered him his daughter in marriage the princess was beautiful and accomplished and bore the same name with the queen of cornwall but this one is designated by the roman seers as isode of the white hands to distinguish her from the isode the fair how can we describe the conflict that agitated the heart of tristram he adored the first isode but his love for her was hopeless and not unaccompanied by remorse moreover the sacred quest on which he had now entered demanded of him perfect purity of life it seemed as if a happy destiny had provided for him in the charming princess isode of the white hands the best security for all his good resolutions this last reflection determined him they were married and passed some months in tranquil happiness at the court of king hoel the pleasure which tristram felt in his wife's society increased day by day an inward grace seemed to stir within him from the moment when he took the oath to go on the quest of the holy grail it seemed even to triumph over the power of the magic love potion the war which had been quelled for a time now burst out anew tristram as usual was foremost in every danger the enemy was worsted in successive conflicts and at last shut himself up in his principal city tristram led on the attack of the city as he mounted a ladder to scale the walls he was struck on the head by a fragment of rock which the besieged threw down upon him it bore him to the ground where he lay insensible as soon as he recovered consciousness he demanded to be carried to his wife the princess skilled in the art of surgery would not suffer any one but herself to touch her beloved husband her fair hands bound up his wounds Tristram kissed them with gratitude, which began to grow into love. At first the devoted cares of Isode seemed to meet with great success, but after a while these flattering appearances vanished, and in spite of all her care, the malady grew more serious day by day. In this perplexity an old squire of Tristram's reminded his master that the Princess of Ireland, afterwards Queen of Cornwall, had once cured him under circumstances quite as discouraging he called isode of the white hands to him told her of his former cure added that he believed the queen isode could heal him and that he felt sure that she would come to his relief if sent for isode of the white hands consented that jesnes a trusty man and skilful navigator should be sent to cornwall tristram called him and giving him a ring take this he said to the queen of cornwall tell her that tristram near to death demands her aid if you succeed in bringing her with you place white sails to your vessel on your return that we may know of your success when the vessel first heaves in sight but if queen isoda refuses put on black sails there will be the presage of my impending death jesnes performed his mission successfully king mark happened to be absent from his capital and the queen readily consented to return with the bark to Brittany. Gasnes closed his vessel in the whitest of sails, and sped his way back to Brittany. Meantime the wound of Tristram grew more desperate day by day. His strength, quite prostrated, no longer permitted him to be carried to the seaside daily, as had been his custom from the first moment, when it was possible for the bark to be on the way homeward. He called a young damsel, and gave her in charge to keep watch in the direction of cornwall and to come and tell him the color of the sails of the first vessel she should see approaching when isoda of the white hands consented 
that the Queen of Cornwall should be sent for, she had not known all the reasons which she had for fearing the influence which renewed intercourse with that princess might have on her own happiness. She had now learned more, and felt the danger more keenly. She thought, if she could only keep the knowledge of the Queen's arrival from her husband, she might employ in his service any resources which her skill could supply, and still avert the dangers which she apprehended. When the vessel was seen approaching, with its white sails sparkling in the sun, the damsel, by command of her mistress, carried word to Tristram that the sails were black. Tristram, penetrated with inexpressible grief, breathed a profound sigh, turned away his face, and said, Alas, my beloved, we shall never see one another again. Then he commanded himself to God, and breathed his last. The death of Tristram was the first intelligence which the Queen of Cornwall heard on landing. She was conducted almost senseless into the chamber of Tristram, and expired holding him in her arms. Tristram, before his death, had requested that his body should be sent to Cornwall, and that his sword, with the letter he had written, should be delivered to King Mark. The remains of Tristram and Isode were embarked in a vessel, along with the sword, which was presented to the King of Cornwall. He was melted with tenderness when he saw the weapon which slew Morant of Ireland, which had so often saved his life, and redeemed the honour of his kingdom. In the letter Tristram begged pardon of his uncle, and related the story of the amorous draught. Mark ordered the lovers to be buried in his own chapel. From the tomb of Tristram there sprung a vine, which went along the walls, and descended into the grave of the queen. It was cut down three times, but each time sprung up again more vigorous than before, and this wonderful plant has ever since shaded the tombs of Tristram and Isode. Spencer introduces Sir Tristram in his fairy queen. In Book Six, Canto Two, Sir Calidor encounters in the forest a young hunter, whom he thus describes. Him steadfastly he marked, and saw to be, a goodly youth of amiable grace, yet by a slender slip that scarce did see, yet seventeen years, but tall and fair of face, that sure he deemed him born of noble race. All in woodman's jacket he was clad, of Lincoln green, belayed with silver lace, and on his head an hood with aglets spread, and by his side his hunter's horn he hanging had. Buskins he wore of costliest cordovane, picked up in gold, and paled part per part, as then the guise was for each gentle swain. In his right hand he held a trembling dart, whose fellow he before had sent apart, and in his left he held a sharp poor spear, with which he wont to launch the salvage heart, of many a lion and of many a bear, that first unto his hand in chase did happen near. End of chapter 17